6.26 p.m. This is uh, the Rollins for Planning Board. Uh, this is a continuation of a uh, meeting that was begun on July 2nd and by consent of the applicant. Um, we recessed and um, we're, we're back. Um, so having called us to order, I think it's important to um, uh, review a roll call by the recording secretary and look at our notice, for, you know, how we complied with notice for this meeting. Uh, so present tonight is Charlie Putnam, the chair, um, John Hinsman, vice chair, Paul Kaziel, alternate, and Andrew Cass, member. Um, notice was posted in town hall and outside the town library. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we're really in unfinished business, but part of the unfinished business is that the um, applicant has provided us with a revised uh, application and a uh, revised uh, site plan and so forth. So I think the fairest and best thing for all of us is for the applicant to have an opportunity to explain the updated materials, uh, and then we'll have some questions from the board and comment from the public, and um, we'll see where we go from there. Uh, thank you. My name is Bob Stoll. I'm principal of Tri Cape Engineering in, in Dover. Uh, the applicant, Mike Brayton, is here as well, representing Florac Sustainable Development. Um, we, we, did, we did provide revised information. The, uh, the VA1 that you have in your package now reflects uh, a uh, uh, slightly altered uh, layout. Seven nine nineteen, 19 and as we discussed at the last meeting, we had lot four and five that we were looking for relief from. Mr. Jones, could you turn the table to here? That's, that's Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Now they can't see. <laughs> I'm going to invite anybody in the room if you want to move to another place so you can see it better. Feel free. So, we were asking for the relief for lots four and lot five, and, and what we've done here is we we revised our request to eliminate lot five from the request completely. That the lot five will will live with the the standard setbacks, which are uh, front here, side here, and and this here is the is the 250 foot from the river, which will provide uh, uh, an acceptable building envelope on lot five. And lot four, where we were requesting to go to within 175 feet of the river, we've reduced that request to, to go to 200 feet of the river, which is this bold setback line here, which will pro provide us this, this building envelope here to work with for lot four. Um, the application narrative were, were revised to reflect that, that changing the request, but our, our rationale is, is, is pretty much the same, is, is that we've got an existing lot that, that trespasses on, on the, our encroachments on the setback that we're asking for relief from, and so with our demolition of the existing car barn and, and auxiliary barn, the relocation of the auxiliary barn, that uh, our, our thought before was that as long as we weren't in more intrusive into the setback, uh, we, we were good. And what we've done here is we've, we've gone to making the situation better where we've, we've uh, when we're done, we, we have removed uh, half of the, the encroachment of the 250 foot setback structure, set, structure that is building footprint uh, between between this section of the barn that's within the 250 and, and this barn over here that's within the 250. Uh, we're we're it's like uh, a 50 percent reduction in the, in the footprint that will be within 250, and we think that's an improvement, more more consistent with the discussion we had in the last year. Ms. Cass, um, you're referencing the barn on Law Fort. That will be removed, correct? That, that, that is, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I did have one other question. Um, with regard to lot four, the septic and the leach field, what is your intention? Is it to be within that that 200 foot, not going further than the 200 well, feet? You know, we, we haven't we haven't gone that far. We've we've done test pits on on that lot. We have. Let me see what uh, 
you do have, our subject is usually prohibited for the 250 feet. Well, that's, that's my question to you, because I, I would imagine so. Um, we have uh, two, two test pits that, that uh, one is upslope of the, of the structure and one is downslope. Uh, very similar results. So I don't, I don't think there's anything uh, that would dictate that it has to be one spot or the other, but we, we, have, we haven't done a design yet. Okay. So that would be my only concern, is, is septics and leach fields also not encroached in that 250 feet on any of our, That's really my only comment and concern at this point. Okay. Mr. Hinchman? Um, just so to follow up that question, so uh, the two test spots you, you've done, are they within the proposed uh, building lot that we've discussed? We've got, uh, just look at that data that we have here for the, for the planning board. We did a, a test pit 10 that's down right above in here, and a test pit 9 that's hovering right in there. So test at nine is, is, is probably not uh, in a perfect location, but give us an indication of what we're going to find around it. We do have do have suitable soil if we do want to do it up there. Uh, test at nine was uh, um, the uh, 75 inch uh, test pit with no seasonal high water table found, uh, greater than two minutes inch per grade. So that, that's great stuff up there. And if we move it to better position it on the lot there, if we have to over 20 feet, we're going to find the same material there. So we're uncomfortable with the new there. So and just, and forgive me if I'm not, if we're not quite following. So are you saying that it could be? We can commit to outside yeah. the 250. Yeah, we can commit to outside the 250. Okay. That's what he's saying. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> non version. <laughs> on all lots. All lots. All we're asking for is one structure, 50 feet closer. Making that setback 50 foot different, not necessarily even going right up against it, but just to give us a little wiggle room to position the home. We're not asking for it for the septic. Okay, I think that the zoning ordinance says, in fact, that we at minimum setback of structures from the Salmon Falls River will be 250 feet. Right. So, so tonight we're only talking about uh, some structures. I think the rest is associated with a state permit and a planning board. Right? The zoning board is only uh, concerning with the lane. I think normally this would be a planning board issue, but I, I don't think it's oh, outside oh, no. the scope for it. That's a good, for, a good question. And you know, I'm somewhat surprised that it hasn't been mentioned that you, you will also have to get a State showland permit, right? For for that for that lot, yes. Yeah. Yes, and I think removal of, of the bond because you'll be filling it in. Yes, and any any construction activities, earthwork activities within 250 will require showland. Yeah. So he, you know, he will have to fill out a permit, and and they will look in uh, you know detail on. The storm want to impact That's the river. So, Absolutely. Okay. And, and on top of that, the planning board will be looking at the storm water that, impact. Absolutely. Using yeah. some different standards, but I'm not sure. So, so I guess that that my original uh, you know concern is the impact to the river. Uh, is it correct to say that the applicant has done the due to Diligence not to increase the impairments to, to to the Salmon Falls River by getting next uh, planning board approval and getting a shoreland permit. From yeah, absolutely, the state. We, we, we certainly planned that into the, the program. Uh, this is full drainage analysis. Uh, this is the drainage analysis that we, we submitted for for planning board review. It yep. deals with the overall project, uh, but in specifically the, the, uh, the benefit of the setback from the, the river is on the, on the, the structure development itself. Uh, with what, what would be an additional benefit to that is one is that the roof runoff is clean runoff, 
but uh, we would fall under the AOT rule relative to, to small area buffers. So the fact that, that for that given soil type uh, and that given slope, normal buffer to make sure that, that you get the, the remove the, uh, the, the do the filtering that you need to. Uh, you typically look for 55 feet of, of, of buffer between you and the river, whereas this is going to have the, the 200 now. So um, we're comfortable between the overall drainage review and specifics on that lot. We can meet, meet both the shoreline requirements as well as the, the land water requirements. Great. And a special condition associated with this lot is that you have a 10,000 square foot cob on that you remove and then you're going to fill in the hole and then you're going to plant vegetation so you can conform to the planning board requirements and the state requirements for shoreland, for the shoreland commitment. Absolutely, and the only okay. requirement that it, that it looks good. So, yeah, I've done a lot of waterfront. It's very specific what you, can, what you can't do for the first 50 feet, what you can oh, do for yes. the next. There's a grid system. It's, it's important. And that's one of the main reasons I'm so passionate about this. This has been scrubbed and, and cut. And we're so passionate that what we're going to do is clearly, obviously, even to a non-engineer's mind, going to, going to handle runoff a lot better. Like you said, there's a lot of other checks and balances. Yes. The, 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 the study on, on drainage is incredible. I'm, I'm always amazed at how long they take and how much information is in them. But it's a science. It's not. You can't just eyeball it anymore. There's, there's a, a way they handle it, and they build past all of those, or else your variance will mean nothing. Yes, and you're, you know, you're not going to get a uh, septic system made from, from the state unless the river is uh, They have very strong, your, your, your variance is granted would be specifically saying for the structure, so that no one could mislead it to thinking that you were giving permission for any, any other rule to be met other than first 50 feet structure only. And the open land, the open area, is that going to be deeded or are uh, you just going to try to keep it open? I'm proposing that the two open spaces are deeded as conservation land, that the, the they will be deeded as never to be built upon, and in that deed we'll put reference to the drainage plan, but to the, the shoreline protection data, so that everyone knows you can't mow the first 50 feet, that there's selective things. that. that there's actually a plan they give you about clearing some dead branches and, and things like that that we're going to put in place. So there'll be a small fee. You know, it's a town road that we're proposing, so the only thing they would have in common is the waterfront lot and the field in the front. I'm picturing picnic tables, a hammock, you know, it's just leisure land for the units. But there will be a small fee that they're going to pay to keep it mowed, to keep it maintained, and to make sure that the, the best practices for that type of land are, are you know, it's one of my reasons I love this type of subdivision is that instead of giving everybody a piece and just hoping that they all comply, we're putting rules on it and forcing everyone at their feet to sign into the into this system. And so is the open area needed for the for the open cluster? Some of it. Oh, some of it only. Yeah, that we have more than is required. Yeah, we do. We do have more open space than that's re required. That the, the, there is the formula that the town requires as part of our our open space cluster conservation, whatever the, the, the terminology is we want to use. But we set aside that area. There is extra area for well above the required, but the majority of it is required to fulfill the subdivision requirement. That brought up another question for me, but go ahead, Charlie, if you want to. I'm sorry, we didn't have a chance to ask questions. So. Okay. Um, I was going to take a turn, um, but then we'll, we'll do another round of questions about that. Um, so I think last time we agreed that part of the, as, as we look at hardship and the fair and substantial relationship between the, the ordinance and the, the problems caused, I think, I think we agreed that part of the purposes of the river setback are to protect soils, wildlife, water quality, and it also sounds like part of the purpose of the setback is to protect vegetation and view sheds. Um, and um, one of the questions that I have is that historically, and I, 
I'm, I'm an old guy now, and don't, don't, there's a, I'm knowing that there's less and less that I know about more and more. But in my, when I was younger, um, people who owned waterfront property were very eager to, you know, start getting their views established and cutting down, you know, typically a little at a time, um, so that, um, you know, if there if there was any local enforcement, um, uh, they didn't find out until it was too late. And if neighbors complained, it was happening so slowly that nobody found out until too late. Am I correct in understanding? Um, your presentation to say they're going to be restrictive covenants. The restrictive covenants are going to bind the landowner by deed to abide by a regime established by the New Hampshire EPA. So basically, that this is one of the safeguards of this type of subdivision. This is called, in my mind, a conservation subdivision or a cluster. Okay. It's different. Instead of mandating that everyone have 200 feet of frontage and be two acres in size, it lets you put houses where they logically should, and then it lets you declare land as in common or conservation. So that isn't somebody's backyard for him to go sneaking out with a chainsaw or a handsaw at night. He's on a deeded property that he owns one seventh of. Every lot owner has a partial ownership of that land, but no right to go in there. In fact, deeded rights against it. If we find that if you had just broken this into seven large waterfront lots, what you're saying does happen, the state does put out something. And just so you know, the 50 feet that we're dealing with to go from 250 to 200 is the least restrictive. It's on the, the DES website. It shows you what you can do with the stars in front of the water. The last 50 feet, you're allowed to clear the, the middle of it as long as you leave some around the edges that you kind of declare. As you go closer to the water, the restrictions get stronger. The, the last 50 feet is the most restrictive where they don't want any mowing or, or you know killing of, of plants. They also have created a grid. So it shows you every 50 by 50 feet or 50 by 20 feet, you have to get a certain number of points. And you can't go below that. So if at some time the association did want to do some sort of um, killing of dead branches or cutting of anything, th there's a pretty specific rule book that they have to go by that the state recommends as to what you can, like I say, in the first 50 feet, they actually show a house in it. I, I don't know. Um, but they, they show the yard of a house. They show it cleared in the middle. And then they show leaving something on the edges, and then it gets more dense as you get closer. But it's pretty specific, and we would attach to it. And um, can the so sometimes landowners in a land in a homeowners association will manipulate the de the developer will leave in place a good management regime, and then the homeowners association gets control and goes don't like that and and change it. Is is the um, are these restrictions on the common area? Built into the deed, or does the homeowners association have these uh, have the ability to manage this? So John Krebs put that on a, a list, and it's our intentions to put it in the deed. And basically, because they're buying a part ownership of this lot, it has to be done by deed, and to have it be um, something that's enforceable. And your town council needs to review it specifically with that question in mind to make sure that there's no loophole that could bounce this back out into the buildable land or to change what the intent was when we did it. And um, again, one of the struggles for our board, um, and we try to be collegial, and one of the reasons for having cross-membership between the planning board and us is so that we don't step on their toes. It sounds like this is the kind of thing that gets managed in the, in the subdivision. It's very, very specific. I mean, it, it's not gray at all. It's so, um, yeah, and your, what's your status currently with the planning board? Have you filed an application? We, we have filed an application. We withdrew our last one, and now we're, we filed. Um, today was the deadline for the August meeting. So I'm going to say I'm on schedule. Yeah, no and choice, but we we're, we're optimistic that uh, things went better tonight. If not, we will have to withdraw again. And uh, it had no But by time, timing wise, today was the, the deadline. Um, and. Ultimately, I am going to get to a question about um, hardship and help you to understand your, your thinking on hardship. I appreciate, um, first, that your willingness to come and engage with us again. Uh, it was a long meeting last time, and it sounds like we have a lot of questions again tonight. So I appreciate your, your willingness to kind of wrestle, wrestle with us on it. Um, but I, I do have some concerns um, 
uh, and I apologize. I'm going to give you the chance to address address my concerns. I'll state them pretty directly. So that's that's how I'm approaching the subject. Um, you begun developing, or I'm sorry, you begun advertising the development, correct? So my realtor has uh, a customer who may be interested in the house, and it's too much house for me. I, I'm going to keep one of the barns for myself. So she's explained to me that as long as it says um, subject to subdivision approval, that you're just offering, you'll see a lot of people put concepts or ideas that aren't fully approved to not necessarily lose the whole season that we have and take advantage of a particular customer that may be out there. But no um, purchase and sales can be, we, we cannot represent that it is this until it is. And we're very clear. Um, and on, let's see, July 12th, there was a party on the point? Yeah. Okay. And um, your realtor, Verani Realty, has a web advertisement for a home for sale. Lot 6, Scarlet Lane, Lot 19.6. Is that one of these houses? So Verani isn't my realtor. Um, Oh. I'm not sure. Well, I guess they all kind of. Um, I think Berkshire yes. Hathaway was listed as the corporate owner of Ferrani, but. No, I mean, Masiello Group is a, is a company that okay. I used to. Uh, I started the Hampton office and worked with them for 25 years or something like that. That's, that's how I got to the. Yeah, but at any rate, just to clear that right out, um, the, the, the Realtors believe that it's okay to, as long as you explain to people what you're doing, that you're looking to do something, that you think it's going to look like this, and that your, your idea is to start going down a certain uh, uh, pre-marketing, is the, is the demand there, am I in the right price range, as long as you're honest with everyone and you tell them that anything would be subject to it being approved and that it could change along the way. We can't enter into anything firm. It's kind of a, a, a pre-marketing effort just to see if we can line up some people. This is an important time of year for real estate, and it's about to be the worst time of year. So um, the, the realtor assured me that as long as we did it under certain lines, that it wasn't being presumptuous or overstepping, and, and in no way can I enter into any, um, anything firm with anybody until it's been approved and the uh, appeal period is expired, and I, I know that. And yeah. So I'm, I, I I'm, understand it. I'm less worried about the pre-marketing than I am about some of the terms in the pre-marketing, which okay. emphasize waterfront. Um, it does it does use the word shared green space, but it also emphasizes incredible views of water. And so, given my given my concern about the way waterfront properties were managed in the past, I worry that on the one hand, the I don't disbelieve you, but I worry that on the one hand, the, the restrictive regime that's intended to protect the quality of that riverine setback is also subject to a marketing strategy that says, you're going to have wonderful water views, which suggests to me that for $750,000, which is the advertised price of this property, and it was for one of the renovated barns, that person is going to say, I spent three quarters of a million dollars. I, GD, well, am going to see the water. So, so help me to understand. Okay, so that property is shaped like this. I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, it's, it, the land itself is somewhat restrictive. Because of that, when you're, when you're anywhere inside this barn, all the way up to um, the carriage house, you're looking over the abutter's property because of the, bluff. Because of the, the shape of it and straight in. So it doesn't mean clear-cutting trees. There, there are rules in place that we will not step over. Can some trees be cut? Um, yes, as long as it's done selectively. There are, um, they encourage you to take trees and to, to delimb them because it helps them spread out more. It encourages you to pull up dead branches. There's a lot of cleanup that can happen that's actually recommended by the state. It's not just this 250 stay off. They're, they're really clear about how you can open up some around the house and how as you get closer what you should and shouldn't do. But because of the shape of this property, oh, every lot um, down the whole side of it does have incredible water views. It, it does. The, the abutter has a much lower property that's already been cleared 
And so we're looking right over it onto his dock and into that water. And to me, that is one of the big factors of this property is that it's waterfront, but also that it's conservation minded. It isn't, I know it's hard to say except that we're going to commit in writing, but it isn't the type of crowd that wants to come in here and just start bucking up trees. It, it really, um, and, and in the winter, you know, they'll be even that much better. So yeah. one could say that maybe it's a little bit of realtor hype in the way it's worded, but, <laughs> but it, it's also true. And, and it's one of the nicest pieces of land I've ever walked. And I don't know how else to say it except to use words like incredible, you know, town, view, proximity, schools, everything. And and uh, in no way is an attack on those on those trees. Okay. Um, I'm more concerned that we didn't get anybody to try to get the point. <laughs> That's yeah, the, the, the realtors are excited about we this project, yes. and and so we really did want to, to let everyone have a peek at it, and while the weather's good and whatnot, but we, we understand our bounds. And, and, and it, it's not intended to be a, a, an off-limits area either, that they, they do want to use it. There, there is a, a, a beautiful spot out here with the gazebo that shows up in all of Mike's pictures. That, that, uh, I want it to be a recreation area for people who like the nature. I've lived there now for four or so months, and there are uh, beaver and groundhog and big turtles laying eggs and, and every bird I've ever imagined. It's something that I honestly am trying to protect. It's hard to say sustainable development. You have to accept the fact that there has to be some development and that there's a better, there are different levels of what you could do to this land by right. There are many worse ways to develop this. I think I picked that myself on the back, but the best way to be able to break it into something that's more usable and more fitting the zone it's in without wrecking it as little as possible. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I, I appreciate all of that. Um, I appreciate your, your willing to respond to Frank's questions. Um, I think that does it for me. Um, Ms. Cass, and then we'll, I, I do want to get public comment. Yeah. Actually, you, your question regarding vegetation was my question. Okay. So, uh, this would be the opportunity for, thank you again, members of the public, for coming to, to the hearing, and the others also for coming to the hearing, uh, to the, to the, re, the unrecessed, the, the continuation of the hearing. Uh, any statements or comments from the public? Or of others? Yes, sir. Did Dr. Bennett have to go through all this? I need or to have your name it? and address, please. Oh, Tom Ellis, 652 Silver Street. Thank you. So the That's question, question. Is, did Dr. Bennett have to go through all this? Or did he say just, screw you guys, I'm doing it? Mm -hmm. yes, um, it's yes or no? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, oh, you weren't on board? Well. He oh. didn't come before the ZBA while I was on it, but yeah. I came on the ZBA okay. a year ago. So um, uh, my understanding is that he did not seek any variances from us. And uh, I think that Mr. Stowell represented as much uh, during the last yeah. last year. Well, wasn't there a question as to when the barn was built? Whether it was yeah, we did ask the question about the barn, the existing and barn. And we didn't yeah, I'm actually tired of looking at it. <laughs> So as soon as you can get as nice master, looking you houses, and yeah. you, you have to admit this is a better use. And you know, I think Dr. Bennett did a lot of damage to the land. Mm -hmm. And I think my kid's going to clean it up. You know, I don't think he's going to, you know, I have a different go one. beyond. I, you know, he All said right. he's going to live there if he, he screws up. You know, I'll be right there banging on his door. <laughs> It is keeping no houses beside me, which is good. I don't mean to make light of it, though, because um, I think Mr. Vaughn spent a lot of time, um, and um, I, my heart goes out to Mr. Vaughn and his family. I think that there was a lot of heartbreak for Mr. Vaughn between what what happened. So I don't wish on any neighbor uh, what mm -hmm. they went through. I know, I know Dr. Bennett and Bob didn't see eye to eye. So, Thank you. you know, I'm just, you know, what what you've done so far is improved the whole it's zone urban residential, so and that's what we want to do is try to bring it bring it into what it was actually what, what the zoning wants it to be. I don't think the wedding venues and the 
boat sails and, and all that stuff is, is ever really was the what the people in the, the butters in the town had in mind for, for this zone. It just kind of happened. And this is an attempt to fix it on a grand scale. All right. Other questions or comments from the public? Ms. Nancy Dion, 44 Rollins Road. I don't have a concern at all with what he's going to do. I think my biggest concern is is the everything being up for sale already because we already went through this on Clement Road where a person sold a house that before that land was subdivided, built a house and actually sold it before the acreage was actually subdivided and there was a big dispute over that. And I just want to be sure, listening to them, it makes me a little less leery when that he's putting it up for sale. But I still worry about the fact that it, the last one went through on Clement Road without it actually technically being subdivided beforehand. And the people that bought it had to wait until the planning board did do the subdivision before they could move in. Thank you. I just will say again, I'm Gail Flynn, 653 Silver Street. I was here at the last meeting. My opinion of Mike and what he plans on doing hasn't changed. I live right across from that property, and that's my view of my windows. Um, and he has, from day one, included the whole neighborhood, everybody in it. And I think for the majority of the people, at least that I've talked to, they're all behind him 100%. Um, you know, he's showed us plans, he's walked the property with us, brought us in the barn show, I mean, has talked to us about all of his plans from day one, and we feel it's definitely an improvement over what we've been dealing with since the um, Dr. Bennett had bought the property a long time. So, at least to let you know, we, most of the neighbors, I think, are in the green of the town. Thank you. Members of the board, additional questions or comments? Yes. Yes, the only question I have is on note 9. It says in the month of April, uh, you had a, a soil scientist uh, look at the site, and he says on this site, wetlands based on local criteria share the same boundaries with those based on state and local criteria, but no very poor drained soils were were found. So that means no no swamps were found on this land. That, that is correct. There were, there were a couple of small pockets of wetlands, but it was not it was not very poorly drained, wasn't wasn't standing water type wetlands. Okay. So that helps helps the drainage. Yeah, absolutely. And they're all up I think in the um, conservation piece of the trip. There's a lot of fun. they are absolutely yeah. this land is sand. Uh, no comments. Ms. Kenneth? No comment. All right. Um, I don't want to prolong things. Um, uh, let's, I, I guess, let me give you one last question and maybe suggest that Mr. Stoll will respond to it. Um, so I, I appreciate that that um, variance is supposed to be kind of a, a, a safety valve for the zoning ordinance to protect landowners from the you know, the hardships that are in, in, um, imposed when um, a, a zoning ordinance is basically confiscatory, you know, takes away the value of the property from the landowner or deprives the landowner of a reasonable use, and when there's a, not a fair and substantial relationship between the purposes of the ordinance and the restrictions. But at the same time, and, and I appreciate that, that the butters are strongly in favor of, of uh, what Lorax is proposing to do, and I appreciate, I, I really do appreciate your, the, the, the spirit in which you've approached us on this. But let me give you my nightmare scenario. We approve this as a variance, um, and somebody comes in, that lot four doesn't exist. There's no hardship to the proposed lot four. Um, and so, really, this is a an application that's designed to, to, make it a profitable um, subdivision rather than to, because um, there could be a six, a six um, cluster or a six parcel cluster subdivision as easily as there could be a seven on this parcel and the, the zoning ordinance, ordinance wouldn't prevent that. And so I picture 
again, my worst critic coming in and saying, you know, you communists, Putnam, you approved, you approved this to go through, um, you let them run roughshod over the, the river setback, which we really taken a hard line on as a town in other um, um, settings. Um, and there was no hardship because proposed lot four is just that, it's a proposed lot. It's not a hardship to this, this whole parcel. Um, in it, I, I want to give fair credit to, to the argument you've made to us, which is the previous landowner, without getting approval, um, committed close to waste on this property, damaged the, the carrying capacity of the land, um, disrupted the ability um, of the land to shed water in, without erosion. Um, uh, and this current proposal, part of the economic feasibility of it is to, in order to put in a road and put in the, 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 the rebuilding of the property, um, you are looking for seven lots, not six. Um, but help me to understand how that's a hardship and how we explain it to our critics who are going to say, we're not supposed to give variances away. Um, yeah, and, and I, I understand, we, I, we, went, we went through that quite a bit in the last meeting, and I, I do understand the concerns. The, the, uh, I, do, I do think we're, we're in a fairly unique situation uh, with the property in, in general between, between the uh, significant restriction of the, the buffer, which covers over 55% of the, the property, just because of the, the, the point of type uh, configuration of it. Um, and also, the, I think the, the fact that the property has the car bar that, that is, um, it's, well, it, I mean, it's there, it's unique, it's, it's, it's got to be dealt with. Um, as far as the number of lots, we, I mean, we talked about that this, there, there are other options that you can develop for the seventh lot. And the, the, the rationale was that where the, the work, the, the encroachment, as it were, into that buffer has already occurred, the best way to to restore that or, or reclaim that would, would be to incorporate this in. Again, we'll look at one of the other options is, you know, does lot number seven come over here? And, and yes, we don't have to come see you, but then there's a whole other piece of land that we're going to dig up, we're going to put a house on, whereas the bomb's already gone off there. I mean, that's what it looks like. And so that, that's, a, that's our rationale, that, that, we, that we don't think that the ordinance could, could foresee this situation, and therefore that's why it's more here. And, and there is some wording where it says, and I don't know if you had it written there, but it says, does the benefit outweigh the, the damage? Um, how does that word work? Well, I, I, again, I think we talked about hardship in these regularly. I'm not an attorney. I don't understand that, the intricacies of it, but, but as we talk about hardship, we, we, we've developed over the years these, these leading questions because I don't think, I don't think that you guys as, as experts who do this all the time understand that, but the average person submitting this, I don't think understands what a, what a hardship is. So, so the, these lead, I consider these leading questions to help the lay person answer to, to see why they would fit into a hardship without actually understanding the hardship. And, and the, fir the first one, no if it's fair and substantial relationship exists between the general public purpose of the ordinance and the specific application of the provisions of the property. And I think that's where we get, again, the, 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 the intent of the ordinance is to prevent the development there. The, the horse is out of the barn, the development's there. The, the, Feel it would be an enforcement for the sake of enforcement and not for, for obtaining the merits of the ordinance. You, you wouldn't achieve by, by restricting this, you still haven't fulfilled the ordinance. So they, they're not going to meet those requirements of, of why the ordinance was written. So I don't, I think there's a disconnect. The fact is saying no doesn't really exist. Um, and, and I have seen, I have gotten a variance before for a property that didn't have enough frontage to be subdivided. And someone brought up the argument that you're, you're fixing the frontage to get lots that just aren't there. Um, and one argued that the best and highest use of this land, that, that a landowner had a right to subdivide it, 
and maybe has a right to seven houses here. Maybe because of the ways of the, the rules are written and the way the calculations go, one could say, I have that right. There are seven obvious spots. And that's what a whole cluster subdivision came up to do, was to say, let's throw away the old idea of making them all big squares, regardless of the lay of the land, and let's put them where they go, and then um, work with the benefits of the land and protect that part of it. This, um, the, the, I think that the sense that Bob said is important, that, that it says that the benefit of enforcing it should outweigh the, the detriment to the people, and the fact of the matter is that the benefit to saying no will change nothing. And, and if it did have to go to six, I can't assure you I would go forward. It sounds like huge numbers when you see these marketing sheets, but the, the huge numbers are in, in, in trying to secure this and trying to get it approved and trying to get the, the infrastructure. We want to go with underground utilities. There's so many things that we're going to make so much better. But that is a bald eagle already. It, it's, it's got a, a huge cut. It needs to be fixed. We could move the house and leave that lot alone. Someone said, just make it the entrance to the common land in the back. And I'll tell you, that is a detriment. It's, it's sad if that's the way it goes, but there's no way of putting that lot back together just to have it be a walking trail. It, it, it'll either stay like it is or get fixed by, by being incorporated into it. I mean, it's, it's, the horse is out of the barn is the, is the thing. Is it's, I don't see the benefit to the, the water system or to anybody by denying it because honestly it would leave something worse than what we're trying to do and I think that's why you're getting a modders for a variance which is probably rare. Okay. I appreciate that. Thanks. Doesn't look like I've opened any cans of worms or hard press yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. The way I see it is this. We'll go into deliberations next, Mr. Kazol. Okay. Do you want to make any final statements? I'm good. I have one final question, and I, and I go back and forth on this. Um, so we're talking 50 feet, and you couldn't shift this 50 feet over to get this lot within the 250 setback. It affects the frontage of the carriage house. Um, we tried. Yeah. The fact that we're, we're working around existing structures that, again, are, are noteworthy and worth keeping. Yeah, I think if we hadn't been dealing with the with the two fifty dollar, I, I think we would have we would have gone this way more. But at, at some point, you've got a disconnect between, again, a, a, a very prominent, attractive structure there that that, again, you're you're, you're forcing things into the regulatory as opposed to working with the land, which we think that the, the cluster ordinance is meant to be. Just so I understand, you're saying that if, if this is moved over 50 feet, that it takes away from this? Well, it wouldn't change the shape of the front of that lot in question. It would just make that not longer, but you still couldn't fit in the narrow part. You're saying you still couldn't fit a house in the narrow Right. No matter how long you make that, there's, when you put the setbacks in, there's no room for a house in that dimension. What is that dimension? 50, cluster lots are allowed to have 50 feet of frontage on the cul-de-sac. Ah. So when you put your setbacks in there, you, you can't, you, you still need to push the house back to it. It's, as soon as it lies out, right beside the carriage house, is, it is, yeah. And as you can see, it's, it's really a mess there now. Um, we want to fix it. I'm, I'm hoping. And how far is the distance from this existing the auxiliary house to here to look like that lot line? That um, let me see if I can look at a plan that's a little clearer for you. The side setback requirement is 15. I'd say that's about 25. I need to get a driveway in there because that's a that has a new foundation on the carriage house that Dr. Okay. Bennett did. So it's a drive on the garage. We're for, we really are trying our hardest to do. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying you're not. I just want to know a lot of thought went into making this better than it was when we found it. And even the state wetlands says within that first 50 feet, between, 50 and, between 250 and 200, they're really loose. They, they show a lawn right on the thing. If you go to their website, they have a form, and it shows that first 50 feet is, is some of the lawn. It's just a, they recognize that the further you get away, the less the impact is. 
Um, and at that 250 foot, you really so I'll give you the chance for a last word again. I don't. I'm still good. I'm still good. Okay. Um, I will close the public hearing at 7:11 uh, uh, p.m. and we are now in deliberations. Uh, and I, uh, guide me, board. Do you like to have a motion on the floor to accept or reject, or do you want to deliberate first and see whether there's a consensus and then have a motion? I'd like to deliberate. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's deliberate first, and then um, if we spot a consensus, we'll make a motion. Uh, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> I always go first. <laughs> okay. So, and this is for discussion amongst us. Um, I do have a concern, as Charlie brought up, about the, the trees being removed. Um, all good intentions with subdivisions. Again, I think the view shed for this echelon and caliber of a home. Um, it's happened. I think the state of New Hampshire has great intentions, but they're overtaxed and overburdened, and they really don't police the uh, select cutting, clear cutting, whatever it may be, of trees that encroach a view. Um, I have had it happen in my own neighborhood. And despite the state being notified, nothing was done about it. So um, that's also a concern with um, the new subdivision up on Wentworth Street. Mm -hmm. I think that's already begun to happen. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is a true concern of mine, being um, on the Sandy Falls. And again, it's, it, it, it's a desirable location. Um, you know, the recreation area um, that the applicant notes they're restricted, but it's just in the deed to the other owners of the lots. Um, as far as conservation, it's, it's not being in SELT or the Stratford uh, County Conservation Commission, so it's not true conservation in that aspect. It's, it's basically just open space for the use of the others within the subdivision. Um, what you just brought up, John, I mean that the the setbacks, the side setbacks being so close, I have a concern about that. Um, I think the applicant has great intentions. I just, I would be curious if any of the others have, have concerns as well. Mr. Ian? Sure, I'll go. So, what I struggle with is that I, I believe that the applicant has, Mr. Brigham, has wonderful intentions, he's very earnest. Don't know if I struggle with the aesthetics of the property being hardship. Going back to the idea of you know, putting the house or the open spaces in the front, um, and if I was to support it, I would want, and I don't know if we can do this. I would want language in the approval along the lines of that the deeds would uh, contain you know, mandatory cons conservation of the property in the back and in the property in the front, not to be developed, but that be waived as part of the, if we were to grant this variance, and again, I don't know if we do that, that um, the septic on all properties except for lot four would be within the 250 setback and a lot forward would be within the, the variance of the 250 setback and condition upon the removal of the barn um, and rein, reinstatement and refilling of the uh, soil that was removed on the back side of the barn. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Uh, whether it's truly a hardship and, uh, and the concerns raised by, by Chairman and Ms. Cass about you know maintaining the vegetation, so that's where I'm at. Paul, um, <clears throat> yeah, the thing I was uh, you know looking at is unnecessary hardship, and uh, well, it has to either meet uh, one or two 
criteria is to um, uh, will it grant a uh, hardship, and that is owing to special conditions of, of the property that distinguish it from other properties in, in the area. Denial of the variance will, which result in unnecessary hardship because there is a fair or substantial relationship between the general purpose of the ordinance provision and specific application of that provision to, to the property. And I guess the group is, you know, struggling with that. And the purpose is is a reasonable one, uh, or it is or, it, or it is not a reasonable one. Or the criteria in paragraph A having not been established in unnecessary hardship will be deemed to exist if if and only if only two special conditions of the property that distinguishes from other properties in the area. The property cannot be reasonably used in strict conformance with the ordinance. The variance is therefore necessary to enable a reasonable use of it. Uh, and the property can or cannot be used in strict conformance with the ordinance because. And I'm leaning towards towards that one, with, uh, you know, last one I just stated, because there is definitely special conditions of, of this property. There's a historic, well, I don't know if it's uh, historic, but there's a house built in, in the 1800s with a uh, carriage barn. And, and he would like to preserve the front entrance. And I went by the property and, well, that's beautiful. And also another special condition with this property is this huge car barn. 10,000 square feet. I would not want to uh, spend the money to tear it down, fill in that lot, put put in the vegetation, and someone tell me, well, but, you know, instead of only having, uh, instead of having four house lots there, you, you can only have three. I mean, that's that's a lot of expense to be. To be, and a lot of work, to, uh, you know, to be te uh, tearing down that car barn. And everybody hates it here. The public hates that car, car barn. <laughs> and and it would be a, a big benefit to the public to replace that car barn with four houses, because there's three house lots. Well, there's either well, there's four house lots that that car barn is on, or or which uses it. There's a giant driveway. Well, it has to be fixed too. So when I came in last time, I thought that you know uh, we have to conform with you know as much as possible. And then the applicant came with a 200 foot foot buffer. And so I asked specific questions. You know, unfortunately, last time I was here, it was never mentioned that he, he will be abiding by the Shoreline Water Quality Protection Act, besides the planning board requirements, which th there is uh, st uh, stormwater re uh, requirements, which was developed by, by the state on top of it. S and so I feel that. Okay, uh, you know, river will not be, be be impaired by this by this development if if it's uh, inspected afterwards or d during the process. So, uh, that's it. Okay. Um, so I am not hearing a consensus yet. I'll take a turn and. Um, uh, we are all waiting to get an easy application. Uh, we have not had an easy one since I got on the board. Um, so let me quickly run through what I think I believe about the, the, the four leading questions as Mr. Stoll characterized them. Um, the granting the variance would, would or would not be contrary to the public interest. I think for me it, it would be, I'm sorry, it would not be contrary to the public interest or it would be consistent with the public interest. Um, in part because of the conservation subdivision aspects, in part because of the, the restoration of the parcel, in part because of the landowner's um, it, admitted right to, to make economic use of, of the property. Um, the spirit of the ordinance is, I get a little worried about, um, 
in part because the um, things like 250 foot setbacks from the river are, I think, something that a lot of people hate. A lot of people love it. Um, but if we create a precedent uh, for waiving it, I, I, I just worry that um, we need, we must, we must have something very specific to point to why we don't believe uh, this is establishing a precedent of waiving uh, the, the, the 250 foot setback from the river. Um, so I'm, I'm a little worried about that, but I think we can, if we can find if we can find hardship, we can probably find spirit of the ordinance. Um, and again, on sep substantial justice, I think so. I, I did mean to to clarify, and I won't I won't reopen the hearing. I am going to assume that the former owner, Mr. Bennett, has no second mortgage, has no economic interest in this development, because. That is not uncommon in the development world for a previous owner to have a substantial economic interest in the development. And I would, I think I'd want to shoot myself if I learned later that he had a beneficial interest in this property and we depended on what he had done to the property as the basis to find that it needed a variance. So I'm just going to assume um, among gentle persons that, that he has no interest in this property and that. Um, he doesn't have a second mortgage or something that's that's driving the economics of this towards a variance because that would be it would be really discouraging to me to find that out um, because for me as we get to substantial hardship what the abutters have said is that that the previous owner created this hardship he gouged the land he built a monstrosity of a building um, and now we are relying on that condition as what being what is unique to this site. And I really appreciated um, both of your answers to my questions. I, I, I thought they were tough questions, and I appreciated the spirit and the content of your response. Um, I think that an existing human-made condition on a land can be a hardship as long as there is that clear separation, like we have a new good faith owner who came upon this property and in order to repair this property, you know, he's going to have to make some substantial investments. Um, but I think the analysis of finding that there is a, and I also think that in terms of protecting view sheds, um, yes, part of the purpose of that setback is to protect view sheds and to protect um, vegetation and so forth. but. Removing that five-story, uh, from certain angles, five-story barn um, is also protecting the view shed for, for neighbors and for people using that property. So I think, speaking personally, and I, I don't mean to um, suggest that anybody on the board has to vote you know, my way just because I said it, um, but I guess for me personally, I could find substantial hardship. Um, uh, but. My entire analysis goes out the window if Dr. Bennett is, um, if if he's still got a stake in this somehow. Can I make a statement? Yeah. Dr. Bennett, I bought a house from him, an estate house. He's as much against development and subdividing as anybody. When I tried to make the offer, I tried to make it subject to getting it approved first before I closed. I tried to make it subject to a lot of things. He's ill, and the most important thing to him was some, no, was some income stream. Oh. So, but in no way, in any connection, I own the house, in any connection whatsoever does anything change if it gets subdivided or if it doesn't. It was a straight purchase subject to a home inspection, not subject to test pits or anything like that. And uh, for a couple of years, some of it, he will get payments and then they'll get paid off. But, but he, he, it's not contingent on... In, in not, it, I own it right now and there's nothing I can do if it gets denied except just try to get condos in that barn. Okay, fair enough. So basically he holds a mortgage. He has a mortgage on the property, but it's, it's That's just a beneficial. straight mortgage that has nothing to do with anything, and it's just for a couple of years, but I, I need to get it out there because I'm not a, yeah. it, it does not benefit from this. It, it doesn't go up. He's not an investor in this He's project. not an investor. He gets the exact same payments and the exact same amount, whether it gets approved or it doesn't, I promise. Okay. So that's my thinking on substantial hardship. Um, and again, the board, I, I do, we have struggled with every one of our decisions, and I, I respect uh, every member of this board for how hard they work. So um, 
Uh, I, I don't claim any special insight here. It's, that's how I analyze it. Um, I, I, I'm leaning in favor, but I do question, Charlie, as Mr. Hinsman asked, do we have the authority to include restrictions? Because as Mr. Hinsman said, I would like included on this plan. I understand it's just the variance approval plan, but I would like to have additional notes. And one of my notes says that um, it will be recorded. As Mr. Hinsman pointed out, I want it noted that the barn on lot four will be removed in totality. Um, and one of my other notes was a restriction to be specifically put that none of the lots, regardless of this variance, are permitted to uh, build any building, including an L building, whether it be a garage, a shed, etc., for on any of the lots within that 250 foot setback. Do we have the authority to require that? And, and the other. Is that a question to me? To, to my members, yeah, to my I, fellow I members. I, I mean, that's... The most wisdom and you know, it, 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 I, I don't think the CBA has that authority. We I don't. think the planning board has that authority, and they're going to planning board. Um, and we agree to those conditions. Yeah. We're, that's how we're... You're. So I, I think what we can say is that the record reflects that the board believes very, that it's very important to have restrictive covenants that bind the purchasers of the land to the DES um, uh, management plan, that uh, the applicant agrees to that restriction, and um, that you know he will agree to the planning board requiring that as a condition of subdivision approval. Because that's normally where you'd put that in, is on subdivision approval. Okay. I think we've added that the buyer will be removed on the new set of plans already. Yeah, that they, and all, all the plans that are you know, for planning board and view, it does, it does come out to be removed. Certainly, and to go to the development. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I, I mean, in, in the trees, the, the, the view, that was my other concern. But again, if we can't put restrictions, make notes of restrictions, um, I, I'm struggling. I mean, again, the applicant has made a, a stated a very good case. Um, you know, I go back and forth. He's, he he seems to be bettering it. Is there truly un unnecessary hardship? I'm leaning towards approving it, but again, my concern that be that the, our approval note these specific conditions. But I guess we have no way of, of ensuring that the planning board will include that, other than Mr. Hensman as the chair of the planning board. <laughs> I mean, I think that's an excellent. I, I'm serious. But are they bound by that? that? I no. mean, and that so they're not though. No. Right. But it's. I, I, I'm going to do the old man thing again. <laughs> I'm so old that when I was planning for the chair, the CBA didn't want us in the room. Right. Didn't and so it's, it's really good, I believe, good for the town to have John's expertise on the, on the board and to have that avenue of communication. Um, it, we're, we're a small town. People don't, don't want to do the wrong thing. Right. Uh, and I, I think uh, this is going to be a healthy process. So I trust Mr. Hinson. So again, I'm I'm leaning towards approving the, the application in favor of it. So it sounds like um, there is a consensus in favor of approval, subject to conditions. Correct. As far as I'm concerned. And I and, and I don't know why we can't put conditions in. I don't know why we can't say that. That in in uh, finding hardship. I mean, we're sort of almost doing like a, you know, carbon credit sort of thing analysis. You know, we're moving the barn or something else. I mean, I'm just um, if the applicant's willing to agree to those conditions as part of the his application, I'm I'm inclined as I will support it. And I think as a board, it, it just it gives us. Um, Leverage if this issue does come before us again, that this was very specific. It was a one lot situation. The restrictions, as far as any outbuildings, garages, sheds, that's not permitted, and I specifically want that language included, and I want it recorded. I, I don't want it just noted in deeds. I want it on the plan that will be recorded. Um, 
I, I think that's important. And again, I, I just think as far as setting precedent in the future, it just is very clear for future boards to see why we, we made the decision that we made. Um, I just want to be sure that I'm clear when we get a, and somebody else can state the motion or I can try to state it for you. But restrictive covenants, um, a variance um, of the 250 foot setback on parcel four only, only to 200 feet. Correct. Correct. And septic to be all septic. within that yes. 200 100 feet, and all of the septic and all the lots to be within the 250 feet. Correct. That's so, my understanding. Okay. Beyond. outbuildings or sheds within the 250 foot. Please don't, including but not limited to that legal language that <laughs> bounds anything that may not be stated. <laughs> I was going to say that Mr. Stoll had chosen a better, a better path in life than being a lawyer. All right. Um, uh, removal of the barn? Correct. On lot four. Completely. Yes. Uh, are we talking about uh, the barn is not on course there, so you report? It's a little barn, right? It's oh, a okay. little barn yeah. in the back that's exactly right. very close here. Yeah, yeah that, that one comes off. And then oh. all your plan is to relocate that one. It, it could make a nice garage for the main house. Oh, the whole place. And then this one, and then the plan is to get rid of that and repurpose re re it. Exactly. Um, and that barn is on 765. Correct. Right. And what about the soils being brought back to? I mean, that was a big Soil being statement place, uh, that, yeah, the soils that around. When we remove the barn, it will fill it back into its natural grid. Well, and I understand that yeah. some of the houses are going to have walkout basements, yeah. but. Yeah. yeah. But our, our whole idea is to connect the two dots and put it back where it was. Correct. That's what we wanted. Right. Um, and uh, the management plan for the. Is it just for the common area, or the management plan is for the entire 250 Riverine setback? It, it, it's um, you know something that we, we've got to work through with the planning board. That was in uh, John Crenn's review asked for that documentation. What we're proposing, typically, it would be for the open space uh, here and here. But we've also uh, one question you brought up was relative to the bioretention areas. And we, we've said that that would be part, part of the homeowners association is responsible for that. So we have we have the ability to shape it however however we like. It. Um, yeah, one of my worries is that lot four does go right up to the water. Um, so that that concern about midnight cutting um, is is kind of most in play for lot four. It's, it's like right in the law, though, isn't it? It's, you're allowed to cut as long as you do it responsibly no. and, and you can actually make a forest grow better. Yeah, no, no I, I'm, I should have even said that because, yeah, no, we've been around this. I know a lot of people sneak, right? There's Is there a lot of people. any way to give the municipality teeth in that regard with this or no? I despair of it. I, I, yeah, I don't think that's the same. It's not, okay. I don't think that's okay. So, um, so the management plan for the common area will include um, uh, the DES vegetation management uh, uh, pr principles and protocols. Absolutely. Anything else? I think actually your language there includes the conservation areas to be in the deeds, restricted covenants in the deeds. Regarding the conservation areas, yes. And is it regarding what can and cannot be? The deeds that are referenced, this homeowners association and the conservation document that is going to go through what the rules are. Well, my concern with the homeowners association is they go defunct. They, we have a development here in town that was subject to a homeowners association that is 
no longer in existence. It's not abided by. So if these restrictions are only in the Homeowners Association Declaration and Bylaws, if it goes defunct, then we're left <laughs> holding the bag. We're, well, we're left with she's nothing. Not go with her fund, <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's one of the main all. reasons they're buying is because of this of this land and wanting to protect it. But I get your point. That's why it did come up with reps. He asked if it was going to be referenced in the deeds. So it's all, the planning board's already um, on it. Been thinking that way. They want to make sure it's not going to be converted later. And all of a sudden, we're trying to get you know condos on it or something, and that it's protected. And so do I. So I'm taking this as advice, not as, as you jamming rules down. I I like I like your book. What do we do if the homeowners association does go to fund that? We CBA can doesn't do anything. <laughs> but can we say that the rules will still apply? I mean, oh, yeah. The, 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 so the the restrictive covenants and the the requirement to follow the homeowners association remains in place. What happens is that they sometimes go to fund, and nobody on the association enforces them. Um, the town doesn't typically step into that. Which is an issue when it comes to a watershed. And it, there's the state DES, and any the, the protection here is that in a cluster subdivision, any one of the seven who's willing to go to the burden, expense, social burdens of insisting on the protections can do so. Mm -hmm. So they're off side of the owner, so they're, they're going to take pride in this. Okay. You know what I'm saying? They own that. That's part of, of they're getting a deed to one seventh of that land, and it's. So I think in my it's not perfect. Yeah. I think. So so why do we have to have it did upon the homeowners of the association which could modify? Why can't we just have right say that the covenants. deeds shall contain a restrictive covenant that says that you know, the two parcels that are um, indicated as conservation parcels shall remain as undeveloped conservation parcels? Absolutely. Yeah. Shall be protected. We can we're done with a lot. Forgive me, I'd like to a big, big believer in good fences make good neighbors yeah. and trust but verify. And, and I'd like to have the planning board take a lead on that. I, again, I, I, I don't think our, our obligation is to determine if a variance should be granted. I understand how conditions can be helpful to, to you and to the board to have confidence, but I don't want to usurp planning board's appropriate role. There's a professional planner that works with them to try to apply best practices to, mm -hmm. to that sort of concerns. Yeah. They will come up. Yeah. And there's going to be public input at the planning board process that I imagine won't be much different from your concern. Then you can attend the planning board sure. hearing as a, as, a, as a member of the public. So I, I just worry that we can't drive that train. You oh. don't think we can say... ZBA can. Even though they're willing to... I, no, I think, I think we can... I, I, get, I worry when we get down to trying to manage how the restrictive covenants will be worded. It's like, we aren't going to be around to do that. We are a volunteer board that meets on the call of the board. There's no way for Mr. Brigham to come back and talk to us about the, the language. Does that language meet our, meet our approval? And... We don't want to subject Mr. Brigham to coming back to the board and going to the planning board for approval. I think it's part of the reason for having two separate boards is the planning board has an important job to do in regulating how things like restrictive covenants get written. Does that make sense? Can you still say that there will be covenants that will protect us? Your, I mean, you can still say it's just not how the word. Yeah, and we can say that those co that those conditions are have been accepted by the applicants. So we've got the assurance that they're that it will be discussed and it'll be worked on. Does that help? No. I'm sorry. No, because my approval is based on this. Okay. I mean, if I don't have some assurances, then. All right. I don't know what else. So you're saying we just don't have that authority? Is what you're saying? We have to just... Well, they have agreed that they will accept the condition that the, um, that the subdivision plan will refer to restrictive covenants and that they will provide part of the planning board process is they should provide those restrictive covenants, the wording of those covenants, to Mr. Krabs and then ultimately to the planning board. 
But as far as the garage, so those are specific and those are going to actually be on the plan to be recorded. Okay, I'm comfortable with that. Quick quote. <laughs>
I'll make a motion to grant the variance. Can Sorry. You, can you condition five again? Yes, I'm so sorry. The DES. Yes. Um, And there's also a little on the bottom of the one. Yeah, because yes. I read another one. Yeah. Can you see it? Sam? Yeah. Okay. And I'll try to capture that faithfully in the draft order. So just the, the barn on lot four as well. Where they still oh, added. Okay. We'll the barn. And we, but it can be repurposed, right? That's a historic barn. We're moving out of the setback. Correct. Right. Correct. Is there a second? I move to approve the uh, the, the, the application for variance uh, subject to the conditions that the chairman has just uh, read. Please second. Mr. Castle separate seconds it. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve subject to conditions? Are those in favor of the uh, motion to approve subject to conditions uh, signify first by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Those abstaining, and uh, I find that the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a long hearing, but we appreciate it. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. This was not. This was very respectful. Of our, I like that you guys came over. Thank you very much. Do you want us to um, review and approve minutes, draft minutes from the previous year? That helpful. Sarah distributed proposed minutes for the July 2nd meeting. Um, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I move to uh, approve the minutes as submitted. Second. Those in favor of approving the minutes as submitted for the July 2nd meeting? Aye. Aye. Yes. The motion carries, and that is also unanimous. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, oh we can adjourn, yes. Uh, are we looking for some people coming back? Or are we going to replace some of them? I have not heard of you. Thank you all. Thank you both. Thank you. 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 Actually, oh, yes. I know. I think some divided. Hmm? We, um, I have not heard from either one that they have resigned. And last I heard from Caroline, she may also have not heard from either one. Really? Um, my hope is that they will come back. Last time, the, the second Gianna was on. Okay. Actually, so did. So I apologize for bringing that up. No, I got it. No, I mean, we've had a rough start. It's a potato um, ten acre lot, and he's in the subdivision. Maybe I'm in the open field, and that's exactly what he's doing right now. No, he has the lot. They got, they did it. You know, I swung because I, you know, I started to be more effective. It's the place on Clement yeah. that they're doing now, doing the Ogden Road. Claude's oh, doing it, so. Yeah, they did. I mean, every, I, I don't, I don't know that being, having legal training is an advantage. It feels like it's just an impediment sometimes. Have a nice evening. Okay. Yeah, okay. Do we just go forward? Let us. Not knowing if we get another pen? I mean, is that, is, is that how we work as long as we have a quorum for the, for the meeting? Well, it creates a problem because this applicant did accept um, the, the applicant did have to get three of right. our votes. And, um, that, is a, that can be a problem for the applicant, right. um, and the applicant does not have to go forward to the to produce the vote. Okay. So, should we make an inquiry to them and see what the intent is so we can move forward or stay the course? I, I would, yes, I think we should. I have worried you know, about it being me to do that because I've worried that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. I've worried that the way that I have run the meetings or run the hearings we gave them offense. I don't think it was you. I think it was my changing 
my vote based on an applicant's resubmittal of information. Mm -hmm. And I think that was made very clear. But I, I mean, I don't take it personally, and yeah, I, I, I'm disappointed, but um, I mean, I think everyone, if they, if they don't want to serve because of that, that's certainly their, that's right. their right. And I wish that they would reconsider because I, I think they're, they're valuable, and they're, you know, everyone brings a little bit something different to the board. Um, so, yeah, the, the more I serve on things like this, the more I see the value of having lots of different backgrounds right. and perspectives. The yeah, diversity of views is critical. I mean, I'm I'm happy to reach out to Deanna and and, and ask her if she, if she would be willing to reconsider serving and you know. Yeah, that's good. I, I mean, I, does someone want to reach out to Ken and, and ask him? I had to do that because, well, like me, I got the advantage of going through br brainstorming. And br brainstorming, I was taught as a leader that sometimes you have to inject, you know, inject some weird ideas that make people think. Because if you want to come up with a solution, you better have some diverse ideas different ones. Absolutely. And just throw them out, you know, then after a while you, you know, then you rank them. But, you know, that's a different process. Ideas are critical. Maybe you should elect like Caroline to come back both of them. Mm -hmm. think? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that's better? It becomes a matter of the select board if, if they're they not going to yeah, they fill the Oh, they do fill the band. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I'm fine with that, Tom. Yep. So, motion to adjourn? Yeah, motion to adjourn. Seconded. Those in favor of adjournment signify by standing up, no, saying aye. 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 Are anybody opposed? Um, I need to get back into it. And again, I apologize for being late. For some reason, I thought we said 6.30. I know we're going back at 4.30.